All right, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our next speaker. He is Glyph Lefkowitz. He is working on a what one day uh, lead time for this presentation. Uh, it's it's for something quite advanced, but he's a really good speaker, and I'm looking forward to this talk myself, especially since it's brand new. Thanks, Mahmoud. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm Glyph. Uh, I did want to start by saying that this talk was composed at the last minute and at great expense. Uh, I also don't I, I usually rely very heavily on speaker notes, but they sprung this so the surprise talk yesterday, uh, and a surprise you can't see your uh, presenter notes at the last minute. So I don't know what I'm going to say when these slides come up. Uh, you'll well, it'll it'll be a journey of discovery we're going on together. Um, so I'm I'm going to talk about uh, Automat, which is a uh, library for doing a thing. Um, but it's unlike many libraries, it's kind of hard to explain what the thing is unless you already accept certain premises. So uh, it's on PyPI. You can just pip install it if you want it. Am, am I not loud enough? OK. Um, so, uh, But before you pip install it, you need to accept certain premises. So the first premise you need to accept is my least favorite five-letter word, and it is five, not, not four, um, is that global mutable state and shared mutable state are bad, but they're necessary. You need to have some state in your program if anything interesting is going to happen. So that means you're going to have objects. Objects are going to change over time. And that uh, ch objects changing over time is a source of complexity. And complexity is where bugs come from. So it's a, it's a paradox. It's like the toast paradox. I love toast, but I hate toast. Uh, so the second premise that you need to accept is that computer science actually gives us a fair amount of really useful, interesting tools uh, for managing this kind of complexity. Um, and there's active fields of research that, um, uh, well, not, not even current research, but lots of very venerable uh, historical research that show us various ways of managing the complexity of shared mutable state. Um, and uh, unfortunately, this is somewhat undercut by the third premise, which is that everybody hates computer science and it's super boring and confusing. And if your documentation starts off like this, then you're going to nobody's going to want to use your library, and they're not going to work on your want to work on your product. Um, despite the fact that these concepts actually make it quite a bit easier uh, to work with complex changing objects. Um, to restate this premise in a slightly more positive way, though, it's not so much that people hate computer science in the abstract. It's that they love calling methods on objects and just using the built-in features of uh, Python to do what Python's good at, which is change stuff around all the time. Um, and uh, one of the nice things about Python is that once you've managed to get an object that internally kind of has knows what it's doing and is implemented correctly, you can just grab an object, call a method on it, and it does uh, something interesting. Even just from a REPL, you can type Python, import something, and go. Um, so to sum up, uh, state is bad. State machines, i.e., the abstract computer science concept that help you manage state, are good. Um, and method calls are fun. So this is where uh, Automat comes in. Automat is a, uh, as self-described on the website, uh, they are self-service finite state machines for the programmer on the go. Uh, it is a library that allows you to use finite state machines internally in your implementation, but expose something that's just a regular old method call to all of your clients and not bother them with the fact that you're using this concept internally. Um, so this is all extremely complex and abstract that I'm talking about state machines and objects changing. So let's go with like a really concrete example. Luckily, automat, the word already suggests an example. Uh, an automat, if you're not familiar, is a, um, a type of restaurant, really, which is basically a giant vending machine where there's lots of little food dispensers and you put a coin in a slot and the food comes out. Um, so this was popular in the uh, in the 50s or so. Um, still really popular in certain other countries around the world. Less popular in the U.S. today. But conceptually, there are a bunch of things that happen when you're eating at an automat. Um, let's say we're going to implement an individual food slot for an automat. Um, now there are a couple of features that each slot is going to have. Um, there's a little light 
on it that's going to shine on the food to show you that there's something in that slot that you could buy. There's a coin slot so that you could put a token in there to uh, unlock the door. And there's a lockable door that needs to lock and unlock depending on whether you've paid for something or not. Um, so a number of things can happen when you're dining at an automat. Uh, despite the fact that the dispensing of the food is automated, a cook is sitting there on the back end that's putting stuff into the slots. Um, uh, and customers are interacting with the front end. So it's really just a three-tier web service in the 50s. Um, so, and each of these operations are something that can kind of happen at any time, and you have to figure out what to do um, that's an appropriate response. So the, the traditional way to implement something like this in Python is you make a class, and then you set a ton of ad hoc attributes on it. Um, unfortunately, explaining why all of the different problems that arise with this is kind of complicated in a relatively short talk. But a couple of the problems that you might see are these, uh, these flags can interact. And they can interact in increasingly complex ways as you add more of them. So I'm going to present a really simplistic model of what one of these food slots would do. But you could imagine that as you maintain a code base that has some object in it like this, it's, it's only going to get more complex over time. You're only going to add more features. You're going to, you know, Christmas season's going to come around, little food slots are going to start playing Christmas music in response to certain things. You're going to add motion sensors. There's going to be ads that display on the front of them. All kinds of wacky stuff is going to happen, and it's only going to make things more and more complicated. And for example, um, you may have to start having lots and lots of methods caring about, is the light on? Is the door locked? You might have to have little checks in front of dozens of methods to make sure that you're in the right state. You might have inconsistent states, like is it OK for the light to be off but the door to be open? Does that ever make sense? Maybe, maybe not. But if it doesn't make sense, then how do you prevent it from ever happening? Do you have a check after every single method that says any attribute anywhere? Gets tricky. So um, instead, let's try the new good way, which is with Automat. Automat exposes a single object, which is the methodical machine, so-called, because it is a state machine that whose interface is methods. Um, so this is the class definition that you'll use to implement this food slot object. Um, Notice, no inheritance. It's just a regular old object. Um, there's no super classes. There's no meta classes. Nothing funky going on. There's just an object with an API. Uh, everything else in the, all the other code that I'm going to show here is just going to be inside this one class definition. We're just implementing one object. So to make fitting on slides easier, there's no indentation. But just keep that in mind. Um, so oh, right. And because I can't see my speaker notes, I totally forgot. Um, there are separate pieces of this uh, food slot. So as the programmers tasked with implementing this one class, there are certain things we're going to be using. So there's a physical light and there's a physical door. And these are drivers that have APIs that we have to be able to call methods on. So we're just going to get those passed to us as objects. Um, now, there's nothing uh, special about the constructor for an automat class. Um, the machine is just a thing that you can do these uh, that has this uh, fairly small API. And so we're just going to take those two attributes and set them as uh, private attributes on the class. Uh, the, the benefit of Automat is not so much that it's going to automate these things away as that it's going to make it safe to interact with them at certain times and in certain ways because you don't have to track what state they're in. Um, and uh, this method here, self.start, also not special, but it's something that Automat sort of makes you do when you start thinking about the model of how you're going to implement your mutable object, your little state machine. And that is, what happens when you construct this object? What state are you actually in? You have to start thinking, like, well, OK, I've got a food slot, but there's all these pieces. What's going on? Uh, so the start method is a way to kick us off from the sort of unknown initial state to a specific uh, starting state that we know uh, where we are uh, right away. So first, we have to declare these states. Every state input and output in Automat is just a method def uh, declaration with a decorator on it. Uh, states are a little bit special because, the, uh, well, states and inputs are a little bit special because they can't have method bodies. If they have a method body, it's an error. Because a state or an input, by definition, are just declarations of like, this is a state this object could be in, and not behavior that 
uh, an object is going to specifically implement. Those come later as outputs. So we start off with a state called initial. That is our initial state, which is what the initial equal true keyword argument says. And then we have the empty state, which is actually the state we want to start in. We want to say when you initialize this thing, it should be empty. You shouldn't be rebooting the whole store with food and random slots. That's a feature for later. So that's our, there's no food in the slot. The cook needs to stick something there. Now we define an input. And an input is just a method that you can call. And here we have start. Uh, again, no method body here because Start can't do anything, only outputs can do things, but it's an input, which means that other objects can call the start method. Now, as it happens, only the actual constructor should be calling this method, and we'll see why in just a minute. Now we need some outputs, which are things that this little food slot is gonna do. One is it's gonna lock its door. So uh, we'll just make a nice simple driver API for the door hardware object that we got earlier. And similarly, turn on food light is going to have, uh, is going to be a different output. Now, outputs can't be called directly. You want to make the food slot do something, you have to give it an input that you've previously specified. So when we want to do that kickoff inside the constructor and move to the first kind of known state where we know what the door and the light are doing, we say at the class scope, initial, i.e. the initial state object, dot upon start, so when, when we're in the initial state and we get the start input, enter the empty state and generate the outputs lock door and turn on food light. So now we know if we've gotten from initial to empty, we know that the door is locked and the food light is off. And then we can add other inputs and other transitions that describe this kind of graph of what, how the state machine should behave. So uh, empty is also a state. And in the empty state, upon the food input, enter the ready state and emit the turn off the food light. Um, oops, I think I reversed that. Yep, that's sorry. Empty should be turn off. This should be turn on. It's Moshe's fault. He made me write this on less than 24 hours notice. Um, but, uh, and now we know that uh, in the food state, the light's on because there's some food in there, the light should be turned on. When we get a coin, we enter the serving state. Now we know in the serving state, there has to be food in there because the only way we can get to this state is that the cook puts some food in. Um, and then the output is to unlock the door. because Somebody put the coin in, and it's time to open the door to let them get their food. And so on and so on. We declare each of these um, transitions between all the various states. And eventually, and this is one of the advantages of doing this, uh, we get this state machine out, which, okay, that's a little bit hard to read, but you get the idea that there is a tool included in an automat, automat visualize, which will print out a diagram like this that will show you all of your uh, inputs, the states, the outputs in a diagram that allows you to see all of the different allowed transitions. And any transition that's not allowed, so for example, if at any point some user of this object in your library calls start, they're just gonna get an error. Because the only time it's okay to call start is up there at the initial state, and we transition out of the initial state immediately in the constructor. So uh, what this allows you to do then is you can chain these objects together and you can have a bunch of different state machines by simply emitting an input in the output of another state machine. So that light and the door, which have on and off, lock and unlock methods, they could each be state machines themselves. And you don't have to know that because as an automat state machine with an output, all you know is there's another object that you wanna call a method on. So they compose very nicely, but it looks just like regular Python uh, object programming, you don't have to know even within an automat state machine that you're using a different automat state machine. Um, and this can even, you can even have multiple automat state machines on the same object if you have one class that kind of has two sets of states that it can be in. Um, so ideally what the, uh, what automat will let you do is get all of the correctness and formalism of a finite state machine um, transducer, but will be as easy to write as just any old regular old uh, Python program. Uh, 
a another library that pairs well with this uh, is adders because whenever you have a automat state machine you always want to have some attributes that you're setting um, and uh, one of the really nice things about this that I should call out before I'm done because I think I'm running a little bit over here um, is that normally what you would the problem that this most immediately solves is that normally when you're writing an object that has a bunch of different attributes many of which might change you end up starting to need to put in lots of checks before every single method like oh did I get that input yet has the user logged in or like am I ready to process that and you, and all of your methods that do anything or read any state need to be very careful about what they read and how whereas automat because any line that is not in this graph is automatically an error all of your outputs end up being very flat there there's no if logged in, if this, if that, you're like, okay, if this output's being generated, I know it's only being generated past this point in my set of steps where it's going to be properly initialized. I'm going to have all those attributes. So, okay, yeah, I think that's about time. And uh, happy to answer any questions. And uh, hopefully I've gotten you a little bit interested in FSMs. Nir yeah. has a question. Just like Nir, watch me run, everyone. What state am I in now? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so how do you do testing for uh, Automat? Uh, Mark already gave a talk on that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's actually kind of an interesting question. Um, stateful testing is a good way to go. Um, there's kind of an open question as to how to integrate Hypothesis and similar tools with Automat, because there's some data here which might be interesting for the generative step. Um, that said, Regular old unit tests are generally how I've tested things with Automat. Um, and what's interesting is by using Automat, you actually make the unit test more useful. Because even if you're not doing any interesting stateful testing, you're doing everything with like most boring like flat unit tests, normally when you write those unit tests, they're all of the other cases that you didn't handle, which really should be errors. You have to ev manually evaluate like, Unless you've tested all of them, you have no idea whether your methods are going to be giving sane errors or going to be corrupting your state internally. Whereas when you write it with Automat, you only need to test the transitions which you actually implement. So you just write a couple of unit tests, add the transitions which you think are interesting, and anything that you leave unimplemented, you at least know if it gets called, it's just going to result in an error. Like you're not going to need to write lots of extra tests. So the, um, the bottom line answer is, less. You test automat stuff less than you would need to test uh, a normal imperative code. Hey, we have a question. We have a question from Asher. Asher. Hey, um, it looked like the inputs didn't have parameters. Can inputs take parameters? Inputs can take parameters. Uh, the reason I didn't cover that uh, is that there's a kind of complex rule associated with what inputs can take parameters and all the outputs that are ever generated by a transition that maps to a particular input have to all have the same arg spec and they all have to match up. And there's actually a little bit of work undergoing, ongoing right now to make that more lenient because it turns out it's actually really annoying to have to have them all match all the time. Hmm. Um, so we're, we're trying to uh, switch it to be uh, any output that takes a parameter, all the inputs that generate that output must take at least those parameters, but then outputs can implicitly ignore name parameters that they don't understand. Um, so yes is the general answer. OK. Hey, uh, just one other thing. You mentioned errors a few times. So the way I'm understanding it is if the machine gets into an incon a state that's, that is not intended, for example, the customer opens the door without inserting the coin, effectively, you'll have an error. Does that mean you're throwing an exception? or? Yeah, um, and so the 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 way you phrase the question is a little misleading because you said if it gets into a state it didn't expect, it can't get into the state. It's when mm -hmm. you provide an input that's unexpected in a given state, it can only be in a known state. And when you pass the bad the the unknown input, you get an invalid transition exception, um, and that means that it immediately raises that exception without calling any of your outputs or any of your the code that you've written. So. For the, from the caller's perspective, they have to kind of carefully track it to make sure that they're not calling things out of order. But from your perspective, 
within your application, you just don't worry about it and it generates errors if you if you, if anyone does something you didn't anticipate. But the, the trouble is, so okay, let's say that the um, class has like 10 inputs, right? So to catch those errors, whatever is feeding the inputs would have to wrap everything in a try except, right? Um, or you could just, it depends how it's implemented. I mean, ideally you're implement, implementing it in such a way that you're just not going to be calling those methods in orders that are not supported. Hmm. And if you want to, you know, you, you because these are just Python objects that are sitting at the class level, mm -hmm. you could loop over them. So you could say, you know, for every state, uh, you know, if you want to have a default behavior, like that doesn't change anything, if you have a state machine where invalid inputs can just be ignored, it's pretty easy to implement that with like a quick little for loop over all of the states. Um, so it, it really depends. Like you can kind of set it up however you want, but Automat's job is just to present the error by default instead of corrupting your state by default. Because uh, you know, corrupted state is just an exception that happens later when you can't debug it, as opposed mm -hmm. to you know, an immediate exception that you can go, oh, I guess I need to handle that case too. OK. Thanks. All right, more questions. Everyone has questions about state. So what's the status of your project? Ready for prime time, uh, that kind of stuff? It's a dependency of, it's a required dependency of Twisted as of the latest release. Um, and so it's in production in a couple hundred servers. Um, it's uh, it's the sort of thing, it's, it's entirely in memory, like there's no, um, and it's got 100% test coverage. So it's not the sort of thing which could be like beta and really experimental, like it just implements the, uh, a pure melee machine, if you're interested in the exact internecine specifics. But um, yeah, you could use it today. And uh, because it's already a dependency of Twisted, which has a super strict compatibility policy, you can rely on the API at least not losing any of what it's got now. Um, it, one of the reasons that it only exports that one like name from the entire library is that it was very conservatively, like just exactly what you need, only the bare minimum so that we could add stuff to it without worrying about breaking uh, code that's using it. So is there an API that you can call to get the current state and all the valid transitions from that state? No, and that's actually intentional. Um, there are private internal things. It's Python. I can't stop you. But um, <laughs> in terms of a supported public API, there are two reasons that we don't export that information. There is a serialization API that is specifically for saving your state away to like a database. Um, but in order to use a serialization API, you need to specify what each state is called in your serialization backend and write a serializer method. The idea behind having uh, the state machine-ness of the object hidden, uh, and in fact, it's hidden to the point where if you try to access the machine attribute on an instance, so if you were to do self.machine, that's an exception. You can't even see that there's a state machine there um, via the public API because we wanted to make it so that you could seamlessly take any object that you'd already implemented in an ad hoc bag of attributes way, transition it to use Automat and not expose any more public API to your clients. Your API to your clients is always just the inputs. Also, we don't expose the state specifically because we didn't. We wanted it to be as inconvenient as possible to have a check in a caller that said, oh, before I call you, let me just make sure you're in the right state. If you need to write that check, that needs to be part of the state machine. You need to say, like, actually represent what happens with that input in that state. And so we, we remove all of the shortcuts to that. Um, and largely because it, there are a number of systems that do this. There's probably two or three dozen state machine libraries um, on PyPI. And many of the programs that use them because you can check the state, it breaks a lot of the formalisms that you can use, like for example, to draw that graph and to be able to look at the graph and say, oh, I know I've been through this state, therefore I know that th these properties hold. If you start allowing things to do state-dependent actions from the other side, then you lose a lot of those guarantees. So that's okay, why it's structured that way. One, one of the use cases I was thinking of is if you have, let's, so the example you gave um, was with the door and the light. So if you unplug the light from the system and then plug it back on, plug it back in, and its default state is off, um, how do you handle the fact that 
it should be on in the current state then. So that would be something that you would probably want to handle on the other side. You'd want to turn the light itself into a state machine okay. and then turn it got unplugged into an input. Okay, got it. Cool. Thank you. Good answer. All right. Uh, oh, more questions. Here we go. It's a lot more engagement than I expected for an FSL. So you had mentioned uh, serializers and deserializers for storing state in databases. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and how this would work with a distributed system, or like work with like an existing distributed workflow framework, like I don't know SWF or something like that? Um, so I'm not familiar with SWF, but I could I can comment a little bit on how this interacts with distributed systems. Um, the so. If you want to save something into a database, you specify in the, the state's decorator um, a serialization token. So typically, that'll just be a string that's the name of the state, but you have to call it out explicitly. Because automat is purely in memory, it's part of your Python program. Your serialization format is part of your schema, and so should be you should have to think an extra step ahead, like requiring you to pass that argument as a way of saying, like, if you pass this, you have to you can't just change it with another git commit. You actually need a schema migration and like to think about how that schema is going to or that how that state machine is going to persist. Um, with respect to distributed systems, though, um, the goal of Automat is really to provide a better sense of your local state um, and not to to provide like a state machine that gets serialized and transmitted to another actor in a distributed system, but to allow you to behave correctly in a distributed system by having a local state object with some formal properties that you can verify. Uh, and then once you have those formal properties you can verify, you can have state machines communicating on opposite ends of a, of a wire. And then you can do a simulation locally where you have them just call methods on each other. And then once you break them apart, put them into separate processes, you know that those um, interactions are still holding. Now, if you want to actually get distributed systems stuff, you have to start having like a cap theorem simulator and start dropping messages between objects, which means you're not doing just plain Python method calls anymore. But, you know, that's just one extra layer that you have to insert. Um, so anyway, so the, the point there, though, is that um, these are not like serializable actors that, that are, you know, migrating code that lives in a distributed system. They're the thing that lets you implement an endpoint in a distributed system. Okay. We should have people say their names before the question. <laughs> uh, so obviously you came up with this library way too uh, you know late, and I have all this shitty code that doesn't use it. So um, what are the challenges in refactoring code to our Automat? So um, Automat is definitely it is designed from the perspective of uh, a deep and abiding sense of shame. I mean, you can see that uh, just from the start where it's so careful to make sure you don't have to subclass anything because we all have to, you know, have our cross to bear. Um, the, the nice thing is if you, you, because Automat is very careful to avoid exporting any kind of public information about the fact that you're using it, adding any attributes to your classes or anything like that, um, any object that has a reasonably well-defined exterior interface that you can say, these are my like methods that I care about implementing properly, turning you can turn your objects into state machines one at a time without having to do anything except some of your invalid transitions may start blowing up your unit tests because you have, or, or your production systems, because you have these things which previously would pass sort of without comment for a while, and now they're like exceptions you need to deal with now. So unfortunately, one of the things that um, Automat, changing code to use Automat has this very strange effect on a class. It get the indentation co goes way down. You have far fewer control flow elements, but so horizontally it gets smaller, but it's vertically it gets bigger because you have to start enumerating all of these conditions that you just weren't thinking about before. And so um, I guess the, so the two comments are, number one, it's totally ready for your crappy legacy code. It's designed to allow migration of crappy legacy code one tiny element at a time. Two, uh, you might want to get ready to do some refactoring because if you actually take an existing giant bag of attributes object and just try to like say, okay, the whole thing is one automat machine now, 
you're going to end up with a ginormous state machine that has a million transitions in it, and you're just going to be like pages and pages of dot upon, dot upon, dot upon. You may want to take a moment and refactor that object internally to be five or six communicating state machines. Great question. Anyone else want to go? Can anyone else follow that question? All right. Well, we are sort of approaching time according to the schedule. Uh, I believe that there are some closing uh, sort of logistics and thoughts that Moshe wanted to put out there. Um, and then we'll have a mingle. There's a mingling area and so forth. Cool. Yeah, thanks. 